and talking with someone. Some of you, it sounds like last night was a huge party. Huge parties in series, all together, overlapping. Well, thank you very much for coming out. And I think I'm separating you from lunch, so I'm doubly happy to have you. My name is Alyssa Torres, and I'm a SANS instructor and a digital forensic examiner. So everything that I say is going to have that slant to it. I've taught some pen testing classes, and people on my email, you know, as SANS instructors, we get an email every day that we teach. People on my email said, when Alyssa speaks, she speaks with the authority of a digital forensic examiner. But I was teaching a pen testing class, so that's not what you're going to hear when you're teaching a pen testing class. You want to hear that you're convincing people that you know what you're talking about. Ah! Hmm. You're right, you're right. He says uh, you need to do the documentation as a pen tester just like a digital forensic examiner would do. But I've always said that I have very poor attention to detail. Yeah, so I'm one of those digital forensic, I'm like one of those wannabe digital forensic examiners. Yeah, but there's one thing I am, truly am, and we were talking about this, it's a believer, Justin Bieber. During this conference, you need to find out who InfoSec Taylor Swift is, you know what I mean? He or she is here. I have, I have a theory, I have my own theory, and I've been actually doing a little surveilling of this person and watching the Twitter feed. But what can you do with Twitter feeds now? What can you do with tweets? You can time them, right? Damn it. So this person, I'll be watching them to see if they're InfoSec. Why are you looking down? Are you InfoSec Taylor Swift? You're not that clever? InfoSec Taylor Swift actually said she had to dumb down her jokes because people weren't understanding them. You saw that, right? Damn. I, I wasn't understanding them. I was actually one of those people. And I was like, well, OK. So uh, I'm going to find that person. We are here to talk about anti-cheat software. Anti-cheat software has, it really became very interesting to me because I was giving a presentation on um, anti-analysis mechanisms in the wild. And one of the people who was in, it was at NetSec, one of the SANS conferences in Vegas, here in Vegas, one of the people said to me, you know, I used to write the software that caught and kick banned, you know, the cheaters on our online gaming. And I was like, well, I don't know that that would be such a good job. But then I started thinking about it. That is the most awesome sample of rootkits that I can think of for people to really get their feet wet on. So I was like, man, I'm a, I train people all the time. I, I teach a couple hundred, well, probably more than that, a few hundred InfoSec professionals a year. So I'm thinking, I need some more sample sets. I'm co-author of the Memory Forensics class at SANS. Uh, so we use tools like Recall and Volatility Bulk Extractor. Those, those are the tools I want to throw at an, a machine that's running, like, back Valve Anti-Cheat or, man, Punk Buster. I want to see if I can capture any of this stuff. So that's kind of where I started off with this presentation. And of course, I have to dedicate this uh, presentation to my son, who looked like that when he was born. He totally did. But he has no hope of looking like that when he's older, like this dude is. You know, if we're talking about gamers, the demographics, the average age of a gamer is 37, 37 years old. Most of them are dudes. Only 42% 40, are women. And they've been doing this for 12 years. So is that sad? Is that sad? Do you feel bad? Does this define you? Does this describe you? No. Yeah, he raises his hands. You're very kind. You're very kind. So if you have been in the realm, in the world of online gaming for 12 years, you know, my, I'm talking about my son. He was 18 months old sitting on my, my ex's lap playing um, Lego Star Wars, man. Who didn't play that? That was awesome. But on the keyboard. So, yeah, now you're going to, like, file, you know, some kind of a... Uh, social services visit to my house because he was playing the online games when he was that young. But seriously, if you've been in the community that long, you know the whole, well, it's the cheaters versus the anti-cheat technologies, right? Why do you think companies are very invested in anti-cheat technologies? What's in it for them? It, it might not make sense to you. Why do they go ahead and, and do research and development on anti-cheat? Yeah, yeah, what do you think? Hello, good to see you. Yeah, so if a game sucks and everyone's cheating, dude, no one's going to want to play. You're totally right. We were talking about this earlier. Shout out to uh, B-Sides Delaware, huh? What, B-Sides? Cybercamp Delaware. Yeah, B-Sides too. Very cool. Good to see you. 
So what are we talking about with the arms race of cheat versus trust? And I'm borrowing from the CEO of Valve when I say cheat versus trust. So the people that are, are crafting the, the hacks and the cheats versus the people that are trying to design anti-cheats. Dude, it is an arms race. And this is akin. I mean, uh, my background is in employee investigations as well as I served at Mandiant. I served my time at Mandiant doing incident handling. So I've worked both sides of digital forensics. Um, I'm really circling around and talking about APT. So APT, well, the whole arms race of the APT, one-upsmanship, is, is kind of a parallel to this universe that I've kind of ventured into. Oh, I spelled percent wrong, sorry. So 1%, it's only 1% of online gamers are actually cheaters. But it's that 1%, or you could say percent if you're reading, um, that are actually causing the havoc. They make games suck. So if you're online and someone's cheating, I mean, they have the ability to kill everyone who is actually on the map. That's so lame, you know? And it, it ruins the game for everyone. And oftentimes, you, if you're on the forums, uh, you can see people complaining about this. So, of course, as you were saying, as you were saying, that the game developers are very interested in keeping the cheaters off their games and, and constructing some mechanism that will not allow cheats to be effective, thereby ruining the experience for all the other gamers. So, yeah, I mean, thinking about this, the typical cheat subscription, 10 to $25 a month, and they'll keep on feeding you new cheats as they come out. And that's just for one game. So mm, we'll talk about this. But it's quoted that no one likes to play with cheaters, even cheaters themselves. It's cool if you're the only one cheating. But if you start playing with everyone that's doing aimbot, you know, every shot is a shot to the, the head or whatever. Yeah, there you go. What's up, JP? So it, it, that becomes very lame. So uh, these are my categories of game hacks or cheats. Uh, anyone have a favorite? Well, I gotta ask my gamer here. The only one that raised his hand that says I've been in it 12 years with the burgundy shirt on, what's your favorite? That you've actually seen in action. I'm not gonna have you admit that you've done this before. The bot, the hacks? Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, oh, you have one. Yeah. You didn't, you didn't raise your hand before. Now, okay, now you're participating. Ooh. Ah, that's awesome. I mean, you know, in a very bad way. It's awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yes, all right, all right. That's cool. <laughs> that 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 sounds a lot like the the texture of wall hacks. It wasn't. It was more of a map hack. Okay. Wow. All right. All right. Cool. Yeah. The one that sounded most interesting, and actually, there are some companies that want to separate themselves from this one, is the targeted ban cheat, where innocent, like honest gamers, are being targeted for for uh, kick bans. Uh, you're laughing, like you've seen this happen. Somehow they're framing people, so so the companies are coming after them. The anti anti cheat uh, mechanisms in place are coming after them, identifying honest gamers uh, as being involved uh, with. That's, oh, that's mean. That's mean. So that one, that one, they're actually not even owning up to that. They're you know most companies that are allowing or having or hosting the subscription service for cheats are not even associating themselves with that. But why are they in this business? Well, there's money behind it, right? I mean, I would say there is money behind it, but realize that a lot of cheaters, they don't like to pay that subscription fee. Remember, it was 10 to $25 a month. And they, if they can get it for free, they're not going to pay for it. So what do the cheat Developers, what did they have going on? But DRM, some digital rights management, implemented. Yeah, so when when someone is actually running a cheat on their machine, 
uh, they're expected to go out to the DRM server. And if, if that doesn't happen, well, then it, it must be a, a fraudulent copy. That's something that we're going to talk about later because that's exactly what uh, VAC was seen doing, was watching the, uh, well, looking for the DNS cache to see if the systems were going out to the DRM servers. It's kind of cool. It's good to know about. But uh, also, there's a bit of social engineering going on with people that are crafting the cheats themselves because they want to make the gamers believe that these, these anti-cheat mechanisms are actually invasive. So they're actually, you know, encroaching upon your privacy. Uh, and that's more of a social engineering campaign, really. Um, unless you think it's spyware, for real. Unless, uh, we're going to talk about some of these and you'll be able to make up your own mind. But uh, they want you to believe that as well as they're going to highlight the inflexible false positive band kicks. Because with some of these companies that are in, in cahoots with the well, game developers, they're actually very rigid about whether they're going to bring you back, whether they're going to uh, reactivate your account after they've banned you. So these would be the things that are emphasized. Um, and you know, the evolution, you can see my evolution skips quite a few years, but in two, I, just 2000. In 2000, it kind of started off with the punk busters. I'm going to be talking about punk busters. It's still around, although some of the games that you know it's been uh, tracking or working with have left it behind. It's part of... Uh, Battlefield, Battlefield 4, all the, you know, all the way, all the battlefields. So that Punk, Punk Buster came out, uh, in 2000. Then we have 2002, Valve developed their, an, their back. So their Valve anti-cheat. And that was when they, uh, were just launching Steam. So I wanted to put, uh, 2012 there as, oh man, I told you this, this is all about money. So the gaming industry in and of itself, in 2012 generated $17 billion just in the U.S. alone. So a lot of that is probably our online gaming, all those subscription services. Um, so why are rootkits the thing to do? Why are rootkits, well, the go-to tool for your anti-cheat mechanisms? Well, rootkits, obviously, you guys know this, it's all about figuring out what's going on in the system as a Normally, it's malicious code, but trying to act as a go-between to catch intercepts, like calls to the SSDT, so that would be the Windows API functions, or calls to the interrupt descriptor table, so catching keyboard interrupts. I mean, that's good stuff for rootkits, to act as a go-between to intercept these calls and therefore try to figure out what else is going on in the system. These are the mechanisms that are employed by the, well, anti-cheat software products. So we have all of these different user or kernel mode hooking techniques, and that's what we're going to look for. Some of them, some of them are going to be implemented on the server side, and some of them are going to be on the user side. Oh, I put my water right there. <laughs> so of course, the first thing on my list, direct kernel object manipulation. Hmm. We'll talk about Punkbuster actually does this. Punkbuster is one of the anti-cheat mechanisms, anti-cheat software products, and it actually hides the running process. It hides the running process of the game um, by unlinking it. So this is kind of old school, right? Unlinking your thinking FU rootkit written by Jamie Butler, you know, and the FU2 rootkit written by Peter Silberman. I mean, it, this is all about unlinking from the doubly linked list of processes, right, on the system. So if I am hitting the box and listing out processes. I'm not going to see them if I'm using task manager or task list. That's why memory forensics comes into such, it's a big deal. Memory forensics is the win. So the rootkit paradox, it, it kind of plays into why memory forensics is for the win. The rootkit paradox says the more rootkits try to implement their hiding, their, their covert behaviors, the more they're going to stick out. And that is to the memory forensic examiner. I mentioned, I'm kind of into memory forensics. I like that stuff. Um, so we, we call it like a high-level analysis. The high level is what uh, maybe the incident responder does when he's doing volatile data collection. He hits the box and he figures out what the operating system thinks it's running, right? What the operating system can see as network connections and the like. 
And the low level or detailed analysis is going to take place when we have a memory image or system audits. So there's a lot of tools out there that can get in there and generate system audits, pulling back things at the lowest level. So we don't need a huge memory dump. Like what's the bad thing about getting a memory dump these days? I used to think it was the coolest thing. Memory is huge, it's exactly right, man. We need a better solution. So I'm saying that and I actually, I own part of the memory forensics class at SANS. I'm saying that and I stand there and I tell people, I know you're learning this, but you have to, you have to already be thinking ahead. This, this technique, it's not gonna work. I mean, at, at Mandiant, I thought I knew something going in and uh, being able to run volatility against an entire memory image. I realized I touched volatility maybe twice. I parsed memory images twice. The rest of it was audits. It was only because we were pulling back data from servers um, and machines, like gaming machines. Dude, they have so much memory. Insanity. So especially if I'm doing it remotely, this is going to take a long time. We have to keep that in mind. So we still require that high-level analysis as if we're hitting the box and running Task Manager, and we compare it to the detail analysis, whether we get it from a memory dump or whether we get it from audits, like process audits we're pulling back. There's a couple of tools out there that will do process audits. Of course, I'm thinking of Redline because I was brainwashed when I was at Mandiant. Anyone from Mandiant here? Welcome, friends. No. Elsewhere. Yeah? FireEye? Oh, okay. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, so you know. Do you know how to use Mir yet? Or are you still clean? Your, your hands are still clean. He's not going to answer that question. He's like, what did you say? What is that product that you just said? Mir? Mir? What? Yeah, you're still innocent. I can see it in your eyes. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Redline, but there's a lot of other ones. I mean, CrowdStrike has their, uh, what is it? Crowd Falcon. That's kind of cool and it will pull back audits as well. So, that's, a, keep looking for these tools because they're up and coming. The ability to just do process audits at the lowest level. I'm going to show you Redline. Um, I have a screenshot and I've, I've actually run a Redline analysis against one of my machines that was running back. Um, of course, I spoke to this already. We either have the implementation of trying to catch the cheater on the server side. So kind of the server admin has the ability to monitor and kind of revise the boundaries in which he's gonna catch someone, or it can be client side implementations. So this, this is normally uh, pretty cut and dry. Whether someone's cheating, we have a lot of mechanisms going on on the client side to detect those cheating. So um, this would be where your root kits are gonna be found. Nice. Um, and then of course the hybrid implementations where you have a little bit on the client and a little bit on the server, and we bring those these uh, uh, together to make some decisions about whether the client or whether the gamer is cheating. So some examples. The first example I'm going to talk to you about, and shout out if you've ever been the victim of one of these. Uh, this one is just server side, and this is Fair Fight. So Fair Fight is all about giving the server admin the ability to decide, you know, both who to ban from their server. Um, and how long the duration is all up to the server admin. Very good. Um, so they look at player statistics and gameplay actions to try to catch some of those crazies, you know, some of those crazy hacks and cheats that we mentioned on a couple slides ago. We also um, look at server side cheat detection. So they're looking for particular mechanisms that are going to be only found on the server. And this is just an example of one that works only on server. We look at the, uh, the other example I'm going to throw up there. It's end protect game guard. People hate it when they have stuff running on their machines. Like they'd rather have a server thoroughly thrashing whatever data they're sending to the server. I mean that's totally cool with them. But if they have something, some mechanism running on the machine, it really pisses them off. I mean I've been reading a lot of forums and I'm not feeling my own anger. I don't feel my own anger. What did you say? What did you say? Game guard is. I heard something about someone couldn't attach his printer. I mean, some strange things that if I attach my printer, it does not allow the machine to really run. That's horrible. Wow. So this one's supposed to do automatic updates. It's supposed to push out. Yeah, and that's not good, right? Certainly don't want, yeah, this was the one that people talked about being like false positive 
uh, band. Not good. So but largely, this is on the server side, or rather the client side, the, the opposite of what we just talked about with uh, Fair Fight. And this is the one that's going to hide the game application monitors in real time system memory of the gamer system. This one's really invasive. Um, if you're looking at old school, I mean, you could not have an antivirus product running on this machine with the key logging that was going on on the keyboard, or you'd have to whitelist this application and uh, its anti cheat mechanisms. Certainly, uh, with it's going to jump in there and block Windows API calls. Yeah. Insane. So that one is on the very invasive side of the house. Uh, and I, I can tell you guys are just getting angry just sitting there, right? Pissing you off right now. All right. So Punk Buster, Punk Buster Online Countermeasures is, you know, this is the one I want to get my hands on because it, it's more prevalent than I think than Game Guard at this point in time. It's out there, of course, the developer's perspective, and there's a nice quote from, uh, from their website. We daily battled the selfish little punks who want to ruin your favorite online games and the hack writers who supply them with cheats. So what are they implementing? Real-time memory scanning, much like GameGuard. Um, to the servers checking as well. So this one's a bit of a hybrid, right? Because it has server mechanisms as well as client side. And oh, man, screen captures. And these screen captures can be used for uh, the, the server admins to make decisions as to whether people should be uh, ban kicked. Band. Um, clean player name functionality. So you can actually implement this on your server if you're hosting a game, game server. You can say you can only use clean names. That's cool. Yes, yes. Real time server log streaming if you want to uh, do some centralized logging. And um, yes, this is largely associated right now, probably as most popular, is the Battlefield game series, which I'm currently downloading. Um, I'm about to set this up on my machine. But yeah, it's like 25 gigs and hotel internet being what it is. Uh, uh. My son's like, yes, mom, yes, get it, get it. He's in heaven. So what what's, you need to know about Punk Buster is any game you're running has to be, you have to have admin privileges as you're running it. Well, why? It's constantly accessing memory. So you can't just run the game as a standard user. You have to give it admin privileges because of what Punk Buster needs to do to thoroughly thrash your machine. It, it needs access to the kernel course, right? Um, and the gamer's perspective, this is what I caught someone talking about. Dude, so they're, they're just thrashing uh, one anti-cheat uh, product after another. He says, yeah, just like Punk Buster installs as a service without your permission, it keeps running in the background even when you're not playing or even after you uninstall it. That's cool. I mean, cool as in extremely invasive. You see, I get very excited when artifacts are going to be obvious. If they're laying out there in the open, I get really excited about them. Being a forensic examiner, Things are getting really hard for us, especially if you're dealing with incident response, right? Do I have any forensic examiners in the room? Thank, thank you, man. Thank you. Cool. You know how hard things are. Yeah, the, the uh, sophisticated attackers are getting more and more savvy with NTFS. They're cleaning out the registry. They're actually wiping things instead of just deleting. It's a sad state of affairs. They're trying to leave us a clean system? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, you know. You have a hand up. I resent that comment. All right. So there's actually two consequences. Two consequences, um, and they become more severe, obviously, with Punk Buster. Punk Buster can deem your um, your actual version or license to the game as uh, something that's going to be barred from playing. Dude, but that's that's less severe than barring your actual hardware. Because you can get a new license, but if they bar your hardware, they create a unique signature on your hardware and they can identify it, um, you'd have to buy new hardware uh, in order to run. And I'm not sure what they're, they're keying off of. If, if it was MAC address, could you get around that? Are you serious? Are you sure because you have gotten around this? Mm -hmm. Damn. To, to move through the levels there of, of GUI banning to hardware banning, and then get around hardware banning. Amazing. OK, so getting deeper than the network. Awesome. I mean, better, better, right? A little bit better. <laughs> 
I like things that work. That's why I'm always in favor of things that make sense and work. So what are we agreeing to here when we're, when we're jumping on board with Punk Buster? What are we actually agreeing to? Because that was part of my abstract, was taking a look at the EULA and user license agreement and saying, eh, you know, does this fit? Seeing as how they're going to be on my machine, they have access to kernel, and can do anything they want, honestly. Obviously, they're intercepting some Windows APIs, they're messing with the SSDT. Um, what am I agreeing to? Well, yes, I'm agreeing to the actual transfer of screenshots. So, okay, I know that there's a legitimate, seemingly legitimate purpose for screenshots, and, you know, I can take them myself with this mechanism that they use for Punk Buster. So, I understand that. And then I'm also agreeing that the invasive nature of Punk Buster software is necessary in order to meet this purpose and goal, in order to yeah, provide a good environment for everyone to play with. Uh, and then, I agree that any harm or lack of privacy resulting from the installation and use of Punk Buster software is not as valuable to the licensee as the potential ability to play interactive online games. So my privacy is not as valuable. Well, some of you would probably agree with this, right? It's not as valuable as just my ability to play, man, because I need to get my play on, you know? So I don't know whether you ever read that or not. Have you? Have you ever read that? You probably felt it in your gut, what you were doing, but now you know for sure. You're, let, you're letting them do this. All right. So now we're going to talk about Steam. Um, talk about right around 2002. Steam came around. Uh, is Valve's online game launcher or distribution center. Uh, and it's pretty darn cool. It has a little chat mechanism in it. But what are we agreeing to with their subscriber agreement? It's much the same. Hey, directly or indirectly, uh, you will not directly or indirectly disable, circumvent, or otherwise interfere with the operation of software designed to prevent or report the use of cheats, right? So you cannot interfere with what they have going on in order to catch you. Um, so I, you know, when I created, I did four memory dumps and took a look at all of them. I was hoping that this didn't, you know, violate the agreement here because I was, you know, minimizing my screen and creating a memory dump. I don't think it did. But if I'd taken the action after identifying or isolating said driver, whatever mechanism they had employed on my machine, maybe that would be interfering and I would have been in violation of that. So what are we talking about? Valve anti-cheat. With, with VAC, dude, it was released in 2002 with CrowdStrike. Yeah. Oh, no. No, I got it wrong? Boy, oh, you know who CrowdStrike is. Yeah, I, I have, uh, I have applied to them. So I have a little bit of a, you know, what is it called when you're stuck? C country strike. I'm kidding. I, I, I played. I swear to God, I played before. Mm hmm Yeah, man. All right. So Counter Strike. That was 2002, dude. I was playing that game in 2002, but it was a long time ago, and there's been some water on the bridge and all that, all that. But uh, so, how many? How does this match up with what what we are? We said one percent of our players are cheaters. It looks as though that does, in fact, match up. Well, one percent of the total accounts that Steam accounts that exist, one point two eight percent are currently banned. So, is that the tip of the iceberg? And we have a whole lot more. <laughs> You're saying yes. <laughs> it's, I have one of my references was a gentleman who decided to go rogue and become a cheater. He says it took him two hours to get banned. He, he just wasn't very good at it. He was very loud. You see that this is the practice ground. This is a practice ground for being a, a sophisticated adversary. You have been, or your friends. Awesome. Very cool research. So, so I'm, I'm going to be going down that road. So I'm going to be going down that road. I'm just, I'm just beginning my, my journey. So if I'm going to get arrested, perhaps you should let me know as I, I start. <laughs> I'll give a black bag while I'm there. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. Oh, these guys? Okay. So this is what, I mean, this is what confirmed, dude, I really need to look into this. Because of Valve anti-cheat, have you heard? You probably read this article because it was covered in Wired. 
uh, actually the response, a retort to what was talked about on Reddit uh, was covered in, in Wired. You know all this. No wonder you're nodding. You've done all this research before. But yeah, this was, it was actually, this was this year. I, I didn't party last night. But now you're going to remember, now you're going to remember that, it, oh my gosh, that was this year. She's actually talking current, current, current shit. Yeah, you know. I, obviously, maybe it was a vision that I was having of, of future presentations. I got it 90% right, so we should be impressed at my psychic ability. I think I really, we should turn this around and be very optimistic. That's what, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah, yeah, it was an article that came out in February, but it was in response to the Reddit, like, blah, 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 you know, oh my gosh, what we've found is this, this current version of Valve Anti-Cheat is scraping the DNS cache of the actual gamers' machines, which had everyone up in arms, right? Because that ain't right, and that's, that's my private information. Uh, it being highly volatile, I still don't want anyone to look at it, because it shows where I've been, uh, or what machine, or what machines, domain names my machine has attempted to translate there to IP. So the CEO actually came back and explained what was actually, what was actually happening. Well, it was in fact looking at DNS cache, but it was looking for the phone home of the DRM, digital rights management you know, function of the, uh, the cheats. Dude, it was the cheat that was oh, digital rights management for the cheat software in and of itself. So, um, it tried to catch that in the DNS cache, but only after it found some type of Im indication that there was a cheat in play. So it, it didn't even start with this step. It had to have initial suspicion in order to circle back around. This is what he says. It had to have initial suspicion in order to take a look to see a partial match of DRM web servers. And then if there was a partial match, it would hash all of the values that were in the DNS cache and send that back up to the Valve servers. So there could be further analysis. They could decide whether to kick ban someone or not. So that's what was really going down. And I, this is amazing. Um, he, he, he mentions, the article mentions, which cited in my references, that this was only in play for 13 days. That's how fast this arms race is moving. He thought I was just using, you know, a very popular term. Dude, 13 days. They thought they had something that was highly effective at catching the, the cheats. And it only was good for 13 days until they figured out a way around it. What did you say? Oh, you th that probably speeded it up. Huh? <laughs> yeah, good point, good point. So it was easy to chop and change when you had it all in front of you. Aha. All right, so this is exactly what he says. CEO responds from Valve, Gabe, Gabe Newell. He says, trust is a critical part of a multi player, game, community, trust in the developer, trust in the system, and trust in the other players. Cheats are a negative sum game where a minority benefits less than the majority is harmed. I like it. I like it. So I had to throw it up there. A little bit of a good luck charm. You know, I'm doing a presentation. So how to detect this stuff? That's what I'm really interested in. And I, of course, I started off with perhaps, uh, I should have started off with Punk Buster, you know what I mean? But the one I spent a lot of time on was VAC. And I, I largely think that VAC uh, it has a lot of server-side functionality. We're going to see, and you'll probably agree with me after I show you what I've seen, um, but this is the way I approach it. I want to go in there, if I have a machine that's running and I want to isolate um, the drivers that are at play on the server, on the client side, um, I would go in there and do some live collection of audits. Why do I want to do live collection? This is, this is my way to do digital signature verification. You're not going to get this from a memory image. You're just not. So. I can do this with Redline, but there's other tools out there. Um, service enumeration, that's going to be key because a lot of our anti-cheat functionality, a lot of our cheat anti-cheat software products are going to create a new service. Um, so if I can get in there and enumerate services as well as do digital signature verification against the service DLLs, I have a leg up, right? I can rule out all the cruft and take a look at everything that's left. It might be signed. I mean, on a 64-bit machine, it better be signed. So I can go ahead and see, okay, who, is, who would this be signed by? Which particular company is going to be behind this? Uh, and then I'm going to do, use my MD5 whitelisting, again, to remove the cruft, because we know that cheats are going after the anti-cheat software. So there's a bit of obfuscation. Have you ever noticed 
that there is a legitimate SVC host.exe in the app data local temp directory? What is that SVC host.exe? How is that thing? Have you ever dropped that MD5 thinking, oh shit, I found something good? I found some, I, this is APT, man. Boom! I'm a hero. And uh, you drop it and it's like malware bytes. Why would malware bytes want to name itself SVC host? Because it's a target. It comes in as malware bytes. It comes in as any malware cleaner on the box. It's, it's going to get knocked down, knocked down, drag out with the malware itself. Um, so SBC host.exe, don't get too excited. MD5, that thing, it might come back as, as something that, that's legit. Like, what, if, if it's misspelled. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit of a science, isn't it? it yeah, yeah, I read that book. <laughs> so, MD5 whitelisting can be valuable, and in those regards, you're just trying to rule something out. And then, of course, we're going to look for signs of hooking, because that's how they get things done. They need to act as a go-between to intercept the calls that the cheat software is making. Very cool. All right. Then, I mean, I'm going to start with audits, and then I'll circle back around and do some physical memory acquisition. I'll be looking for the same things with the physical memory, but I'll be using my favorite tools, recall, volatility and do process enumeration, I'll look for the drivers that are loaded. Loaded and potentially unloaded drivers and signs for hooking. We always try to use two tools when we're doing memory analysis. Um, so we'll be doing that very same thing. These are the tools I like to throw in there. I like to hook and jab with. You know, we are leaning more towards the recall side. Have you seen anyone on the developers list of recall? What? Have, have you seen how many emails they're dropping out? We fix this, we fix this. Oh my God, oh my God. Oh man, it's, it, it, it is up and coming. When PMEM, and PMEM, yeah, man. Yes, so if you're in the market for uh, memory forensics tools, of course, you gotta give a shout out to the volatility guys. Their book just came out. Damn, that thing is huge. Holy crap, anyone got it in the mail? Yeah, I wanted to bring it with me, but sorry, I couldn't carry that. Sorry. And, my, and it would have put my suitcase over 50 pounds, and that would have been bad. So volatility, of course, is going to be our core memory forensics, uh, you know, how we get things done, memory forensics parser and analysis tool. But recall is up and coming, and it really is incredible not to have to specify that profile. Oh, it figures it out on the fly. Yeah, that's, that's enough, man. It's just, just the little user-friendly uh, features. Re Redline, I've spoken to it a bit. I'm going to show you audits that are coming back from the system. Again, my goal is to isolate a little bit of strange hooking, a little bit of a peculiar loaded modules um, that I may never, never have seen before on my system. And then, of course, Bulk Extractor. You're going to be amazed with what I'm pulling out from Bulk Extractor. And I'm checking time. I don't have much. All right. Uh, volatility. There's, there's some info about volatility. Uh, runs on Windows. Yeah, runs on Windows now. Standalone, you have to install Python. Everything's in there. That's what you need to know about it. Um, as of this week, I think, it's going to be supporting uh, Windows 8 in the trunk version. So if you've been waiting for that, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, I, had, I have Windows 8 version support so because uh, I have the beta. So what I'm, what I'm showing you here is one of my uh, memory images that I took from a Windows 8 system that I was running Team Fortress 2 on. See, I got that right, Team Fortress 2. Good, it was good fun. And, and I'm just isolating the services that started right at the time I joined Steam and then joined the server. So these aren't services, these are processes. But why am I running PS scan? Anyone know why I have to run PS scan? What's that? No, actually, yes. But what about Windows 8 Service Pack 1? It's just known, man. What? It's just known. There's something called a KDBG, the kernel debugging data block. It's like if you could have one thing on a, on a desert island, a deserted island, in fact, too. Yeah, it's encrypted. The KDBG, you'd crack it open like one of those huge ostrich eggs, and you'd have like the lay of the land of the memory image. What I'm telling you is that does not happen anymore with the Windows 8 Service Pack 1. Holy cow. I crack, I crack, and I crack. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So I have to, I have to switch back. And this is the version of volatility that supports Windows 8. What I'm showing you is their support for Windows 8. You're only getting PS scan because PS scan is looking for these signature matches as it goes from the beginning of the memory image to the end. It's doing, uh, looking for the e-process blocks for every process that's either running now or has been terminated. 
But I, I did a timeline analysis and only pulled out the ones that were notable right around the time I was starting Steam. I want to know what's happening on my system when I'm starting Steam, as well as launching HL2. What is HL2? Original origins of HL2. Thank you. Half-Life 2. Nice. I had to ask you if or I was going to screw it up. All right. So what does Windows 7 look like? Windows 7 is largely showing us the same. Uh, this is PS list. So I could, I could walk the doubly linked list because I had access to that ostrich egg, just cracked it open, and ate for days on the deserted island. Um, yeah, we're, we're able to see some pretty notable processes. I need to hunt that down. I haven't yet. The SBC host probably speaks to the very thing I'm looking for, which is service instantiation, the creation of a new service. You're looking at me like, why the hell didn't you do that? Hello? This is an, I'm, I am on the road, ladies and gentlemen. I'm on the road. Check back in with me next year. I'll have Punk Buster all up in here. You'll be like, damn, I don't touch that stuff since you told me about it. Um, so we, we also want to look at loaded and unloaded modules. Very important here because that is how oh, a lot of our hooking is going to go down. You load a kernel level driver and you have access to anything you want, right? So I'm enumerating. I'm just showing you that what I ran because, of course, this is my Windows 8 memory image, I had to run mod scan. Again, we're scanning for the loader data table entries. We cannot walk the list of loaded modules. So I'm going to get everything. I'm going to get everything that's been loaded. I'm going to get duplicate structures. Uh, but sure enough, that's why I'm going to do my live analysis. I'm showing you Redline here. All about Redline, Mandiant tool, free, as long as you're not working in the same lane as them, right? If you're working internal, you can use the Redline. But if you're, if you're trying to compete with them, don't be using Redline. You know they'll come after you, right? Right? Yeah, oh, shoot. You haven't read the EULA. Because you got, you, you're free, right? You can do whatever you want. You can use it or not, make fun of it or not. It's all you. All right. So this, this, is, this is the cool part about running a live audit collector. You see what I got there. And, and what I was disappointed to see was everything was digitally signed. This is my, this is my Windows 8, though. Right? Windows 8 64 bit. Would you expect everything to be digitally signed for my drivers? Yeah. So, what am I looking at? It's, it's hooked IRPs. Interrupt routine procedures. Is that right? Interrupt procedures. Dispatch routine table. That's what we'll call it. But uh, all of these functions pertain to a driver. These are the hooked ones, and all of them turn out to be legit. So, what I'm not seeing is what I expected to see and what I will be seeing when I go to Punk Buster. Valve has not hooked any of my driver functions, nor are any of these categories being shown in Redline, showing any indication. There's nothing being hooked in the SSDT, System Service Descriptor Table. That's where you're, you're going to see all your Windows functions, like how to list the, the registry keys and registry hives, or how to list the files and the directories. It, it, they're just not hooking anything at this level. So very interesting. It must be happening on the server. Um, so. Yeah, you got to save Bulk Extractor for last. Bulk Extractor, a tool written by Simpson Garfinkel. Who's used this? You should be using this? Yes. It is awesome. I've had some huge wins with Bulk Extractor because it creates all the, the peek out files on the out, on the out, outbound, uh, man, it parses things like you wouldn't believe. Open up the peek out file. So I, I've shown all the categories of good stuff that it's pulling out. And actually, he just released the newest version of, as of like a week ago. So if you want to go and get, I think it's 1.5. Amazing stuff. Well, what did I get? Um, I started looking for aimbot. I probably need to go a bit deeper because aimbot has a bit of a dual meaning, right? Was aimbot a Trojan as well? Bastards. So what, yeah, I, I was like, wait a second. I see aimbot over here. And actually, there was a lot of aimbot because you know what that is, right? It's the ability to target in and always have a direct hit to the head or the most lethal part of the body. Um, but it's also a Trojan. So what do you think I've run into? As you see, beast door. Bandock, exactly. We have to go in there knowing what we might run into. How many times have you looked at and gotten really excited that your machine was owned by like five, six, seven, eight different types of malware? Just because you see references to it. Yes, you're smarter than me, but that also that means you're smarter than a lot of my students because they always get really excited on day six challenge. They're like, yes, this machine is so owned. And I walk over and I'm like, that's the AV signature. And that's probably what we're looking at here. I fully expected to find something running from back, looking for these things, but I did not find anything. Yeah, so this AV, yeah, I thought it was back, but it's not. It's not. Because you can see there's other malware being mentioned right in there. But 
shit. Don't copy this down yet. Let me, let me go and change it. My, I was going to put my sons up there. Thank you very much. I'm almost done. This is the grand finale. Um, it does keep your username and password in clear text in memory. And, you know, TrueCrypt ran into an issue with this, right? I mean, TrueCrypt, when it was alive and well and viable, ran into an issue. And what did it start doing? I mean, very early on, 2003, 4, 5, I mean, it started, wait, let me tell you what's up here. Then you can get in, in on the, in the interesting thing. This is my username, Indigo Blue 2, Indigo Blue 2 twice, and that's my password, right? That's why I said don't take a picture, but because uh, I haven't changed it yet. I just created the account today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so interestingly enough, yeah, 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 true. So interestingly enough, you know, this, this is something that a lot of our, um, well, clipboard, password, clipboard keepers have taken care of. You copy it in and you use it once, right? And it's, it's wiped from memory. But you can see that VAC does not do that. This was taken like 30 minutes because I did a lot of memory dumps. 30 minutes after I'd already logged in um, and I did not select save password. Somewhere in here is whether I selected the save password option or not. It's just hanging out in memory. And I know we're going to see a lot of examples of that in our software, but it's always good to know what we're walking into. Um, because, dude, who, who hibernates their machine when they walk away? Who, like, closes the laptop like I'm about to do in, like, 90 seconds? Hibernates the machine. Um, so, therefore, everything's going to be in your hibernation file. All of the user credentials for your gaming. Yeah, that's good stuff. Dude, I, I don't think so. I do not think so. Because I think it's, mine just sleeps. Is there a hibernation option for Mac? Anyone? I know. You know what? That's the other presentation. Sarah, where are you? Sarah, did anyone attend Sarah's presentation? I, we should have totally asked her then. I know I need to sit through the Mac Forensics class. So I have my list of references. You can see I still have. I will admittedly say I'm going to tear into Punkbuster as soon as I download this thing and go crazy on it. Um, and you can, yeah. Origin, yeah, 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 that's what I have. That's what I have. Wait. So it's already running on my VM with Origin? I thought I had to get on a server for it to, shit! I totally could have thrown that in today, but I was, I was like 25 gigs down, and I thought I needed to be running a battlefield and get on the server. Yeah, yeah. That's good to know. Ah, totally. That's going to be fun. Totally fun, yes. Right. Okay. Got it. It was part of the origin and user license agreement because that's how I was able to get that whole verbiage. Yeah. 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 So I'll do both. I'll do both of those stages, and and I will put it out on my blog. I'll tweet it too. I'm at CyberTor, S I B E R Tor. It's a commentary on you know, today's society because everything's cyber. So I had to spell it wrong. My last name is Torres, so if you're looking for me. But thank you so much for coming. You guys were awesome, and I learned a lot from you. Um, check us out, you know. Look for us online. Sans, you know, we teach some classes. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a few. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sure. We have a little bit of time for questions, if anybody has a question or two. Launch. All righty, then. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Next talk will be at 2 in this room.